Uh, kia ora koto, and thank you very much, Bernard, for that uh, introduction. Despite the fact he's a Wellingtonian, he's been incredibly helpful in helping us address our, our housing challenges on the housing uh, task force. And secretly, like everybody else in the country, he wants to be an Aucklander. And that's, uh, that's the basis of our problem. Um, can I acknowledge tonight uh, our elected representatives here? I might not have uh, caught everybody, but uh, I know that Councillor Desley Simpson is here, uh, Pippa Coombe, Chair of the Waitamata Local Board, and Board Members Richard Northey, Adriana Christie and Rob Thomas. So welcome. It's always good to have elected representatives here listening to what you have to say on an issue that's really important. Can I acknowledge also the panel members, uh, Patrick Reynolds, uh, Cynthia Gillespie, Peter Winder and Stephen Selwood. It's an excellent panel and I think we're going to get real value out of the interchange of ideas and discussion that comes from that group. Uh, I'm not surprised to see so many people here. I think that transport is the single most frustrating issue that we have to tolerate in our city. I live in the south of Auckland. If I don't leave before six o'clock in the morning, it takes me twice as long to get into town. It takes me an hour and a half to get into town if I leave at seven in the morning. If I, don't, uh, if I leave before 6.30 at night to go home, uh, the same sort of ratio applies. It's frustrating. It's uh, eating into our productivity. I think the costs of congestion are something like one to two billion dollars on a conservative basis. Uh, and incredibly frustrating from the viewpoint of the time that you might otherwise be enjoying with family or doing things that you'd rather be doing uh, other than being parked on a motorway if you travel by car. The 10-year budget released today is open for consultation and it's open from today to the 28th of March and we'd certainly encourage everybody to have their say. Uh, there will be an Our Auckland being published in a physical form with a feedback form inside looking at the key proposals of the 10-year uh, the budget. Uh, but there'll also be a series of have your say meetings and uh, consultation meetings and we'll be doing some independently uh, organised surveys to get a cross section so that we know what Aucklanders are thinking. Firstly, I suppose we begin, and I want to go a little bit broader than transport and setting out what the vision for the city is. I think my vision for the city is that we are a world class city, that we are a city that is globally competitive that can attract talent and retain talent to live in our city, that gives our people choice and opportunity, that's a diverse and inclusive city, that's environmentally pristine, and that protects our quality of life. Now you consider all of those things that make up what helps create a world-class city, uh, you acknowledge that transport and your ability to move around that city is at the heart of it. We know that Auckland, despite its challenges, is an attractive place to live. We are growing by 50,000 people a year. That's an over 3% uh, increase in population. Every three years, we add a population the size of the city of Tauranga, which I think is our fourth or fifth biggest city. So that is great. It's wonderful to live in a city that's growing and that has the diversity that growth brings and the, the choice and the opportunity that it brings, but it also challenges us. It challenges us uh, in particular in our social and our physical infrastructure, which has not kept pace with that growth. In the recent past, we've had a significant level of underinvestment in infrastructure, and that means a backlog in the work that needs to be done. For example, we don't have enough houses. We need 14,000 extra houses a year. We are only creating 7,000. That creates problems with shortages and affordability. We haven't invested enough in water services. We haven't tackled historical problems like sewage overflows every time it rains onto our beaches. And of course, in the area of transport, that underinvestment is most obvious we are still adding 800 extra cars a week to our roads in Auckland. I was reading the congestion question, the report the other day, and they used another statistic. They said in the last four years, the number of kilometres being travelled each year in Auckland 
is increased by 1.6 billion kilometres. Just consider those two figures, and it's not hard, therefore, to understand why we have the problems that we do. So the focus of our 10-year budget is on addressing those key challenges and on finding ways to fund our infrastructure, given the two key constraints we have. The first constraint is that we have already fully utilised the easy way of funding infrastructure. Infrastructure is intergenerational, you can borrow to pay for it, but we are close to the debt to revenue ratio uh, that constrains our ability to borrow further. The Standard & Poor's sets our credit rating based on a 270% debt to revenue ratio. We are coming close to 265%. So borrowing is no longer an easy answer, and rates has never been an easy answer given the sensitivity of rates. People in this audience will probably be able to tell me what your quarterly rates demand was that came in a couple of weeks ago, but you probably can't tell me how much you paid in income tax last week, and hence the problem of sensitivity of rates as a source of revenue. So with the last government to build transport infrastructure and housing infrastructure, we invested new ways of overcoming this constraint. Special purpose vehicles where the debt appears on the books of a government agency and not Auckland's. And we were able to raise about $800 million last year in that way towards transport infrastructure for new subdivisions and other infrastructure. We were also pleased that the last government finally came to realise that a little bit more of its revenue needed to come back to our city. Now, I'm not asking for anything that is out of proportion to our contribution to New Zealand, but I do know with 34% of the population and 38% of the GDP of the country, we were paying masses in road taxes, in petrol taxes, in income tax, GST, uh, and in company tax. And what we're saying is some of that more of that money has to come back to the city where growth pressures are creating the biggest problems. Because when you lose $2 billion a year in congestion, that's not a cost just to us in Auckland, it's a cost to the whole country, and therefore it's an issue that the whole country needs to meet. We now have a new government, and that has produced some advantages from my perspective. The first advantage is an acknowledgement that the focus of our transport needs to be not simply on more and more motorways that quickly get clogged up, but on public transport, on better utilisation of existing networks, and on active modes such as cycling and walking. And I welcome the fact that the government is fully committed to a light rail system. There is just a few of us in this audience that still remember when the trams ran and carried most of the uh, the, the commuter traffic in Auckland. And we are now at the point where our buses are reaching bus congestion levels in Simon Street, Queen Street, Dominion Road. Light rail needs to be the answer if we are to move people more effectively and efficiently around our city. Out down the isthmus to Mount Roskill, across to Onehunga, across uh, uh, the Manuko Harbour, uh, out to the airport, not just because of the travellers, but because in the precinct of Manukau Airport, you've got the fastest growing uh, employment in the country after the CBD in Auckland. And in funding light rail, I would certainly encourage the government to consider whether in line with its announced policy position of using the National Land uh, Transport Fund for things other than roads, that, land, that light rail is certainly land transport, and I think it would be a very good idea to fund our light rail from that source, and would encourage the government to think about that. I would also, but I won't, <laughs> I, retrospectively you have to ask why Auckland paid for the city rail link, the only piece of heavy rail infrastructure in the country, paid half by a council rather than fully by the central government but I, I think it's probably unrealistic to expect a retrospective decision to give us our $1.7 billion back in that regard. Uh, I'd also encourage the government to consider broadening uh, our, our revenue base. When I've looked at how Australian cities fund their infrastructure, 
It's through their state government. It's through devolution of GST. It's through a, 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 a payroll tax. It's through sales tax. Eric Garcetti was telling me he's funding his light rail through an extra imposition on a sales tax in Los Angeles. We don't have those options available, and I'm not necessarily asking for those specific options. But I would ask this government, as I asked the last government, and probably expect the same reply, that you know, when you've got a city our size, devolution of funding such as a GST uh, would make sense. The government, I think, takes out of Auckland $260 million a year by imposing GST on our rates. So they add to, if we increased your rates theoretically by 10%, which we're not intending to do, uh, they, would, they would take that up to, to uh, uh, 11 or 12% with GST. Well, if they're taking the money based on our rate take, giving that back to us would enable us to do more things for ourselves. So one of the things I, I have to applaud, however, in the change of government is that uh, an agreement to enable us to charge a regional fuel tax. Now, I know taxes aren't popular with anyone, probably including myself, but at the last election I went out, and if you attended any of your, the meetings I went to, you would have heard my statement, which was crystal clear, if you want us to do something about transport problems in Auckland, you've got to give us the financial means to do so. And I said that I would be promoting a regional fuel tax because it was more in line with, with relating what you were paying with what you were using in terms of the transport system. We have in the council an interim transport levy, $114 flat rate across everybody. If you're a pensioner that never goes out of your home, you pay the same amount as Sky City pays as a big corporate. That is inequitable, that will go. A regional fuel tax will raise two to three times as much money, probably as much as $1.3 to $1.5 billion over the 10 year budget period, and it will enable us to do a lot more. We cannot expect provincial New Zealand to pay for the transport system that we have in Auckland. We have to make a contribution ourselves, and if we were to put it on rates, it would be another eight to nine percent on your overall rate increase, which will be about two and a half percent. I think this is a better way of doing it. It's not quite demand management, but at least it has components of that. Can I say that any money raised uh, is going to be hypothecated? So you know that when you pay your regional fuel tax, it will go into transport. It won't be subverted into any other area. And it will go into a broad pool to fund the Auckland Transport Alignment Project, uh, which will provide for projects right across our city. Now I'd love, and I don't have the time, but I would love to have talked about what will be in the Auckland Transport Alignment Project. It's vital for all of us. But because we had a late election, well, an election close to um, our, our um, 10 year budget, and because there are new policies from a new government, we are in the process of working through that. We should know by the end of March. But I imagine that it will be about funding um, the public transport system that we need, about extending busways, uh, about making better use of existing transport, of making sure that we have networks for cycling, including, I hope, a sky path across the Harbour Bridge as quickly as possible to connect the North Shore for the first time. You'll be able to walk and cycle between the shore and the city. I think all of those things are important. And I think uh, also connecting the airport uh, by a mass transit system to the Puani railway station would be a quick win for the city. We're working through those options. It's not easy, but I want to finish on this point. Our 10-year budget in 2015 set aside 7.9 billion for transport expenditure over the, the decade. In this 10-year plan, three years later, we will be increasing that to 11 to 12 billion. Is it enough? No, it's never enough. Will it make a difference? Yes, it will make a real difference. But if we don't run fast, we won't even stand still. 
will fall backwards. Congestion will get worse unless there is serious investment and serious alternatives to the use of the single occupant motor vehicle. I hope you enjoy the panel discussion tonight. Thank you for being here to engage in the conversation. Please take part in the Have Your Say event for our 10-year budget. It's your city, it's your money that we're spending. We need to know what you're thinking about it. Thank you very much. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. And sorry for going too long. <laughs> <laughs>